Hey. Hey, Brian. How's it going? Very good. How are you? Good. Good. Just got off work. Oh, yeah? Uh, what do you do? I uh, work for a stone company. A stone company? Like, like yeah, gravel so, uh, and asphalt and all that stuff? No, like uh, countertops mostly. So ah, okay. granite, quartz, cut, right. polish, install. Oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. I used to do kind of low level labor work on some sites and I always admired the specialty craft of uh, people like that. Cabin yeah. makers, countertops, yeah. stuff. heavy stuff. I've carried some of it. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, it's not light. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're usually somewhere like the islands are around 800 to 900 pounds. So mm -hmm. it's heavy stuff. All but, right. Cool. Yeah. What are you up to? Um, I was uh, working earlier today. I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm editing a book for somebody, uh, some grad student who's preparing their, their post-grad anthropology work for publication. Oh, cool. So I'm just editing it for, you know, readability and structure and copy edits. Awesome. So that's, yeah, I mean, I was a freelance writer uh, working from home and uh, took, I was trying to take this, this opportunity to, to look for things outside of marketing, which almost everything in, everything in freelance writing is basically marketing, however, however they spin it, you know? <laughs> you're, all just, you're all just writing stuff that are eventually trying to help some company sell something. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was just uh, looking over some of my highlights from the, uh, the text. Were you, were you with us for the, the, the losing guitar one on the, no, uh, no, I wasn't, I wish. Right. Okay. So who do you no. know from the, the gang? Um, I mean, I met like Rob and Mariana and Dennis when like back with the museum of care and then, mm -hmm. uh, came over with this and then, yeah, they were like, Oh, we've also got a value reading group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm currently I'm currently getting a little bombarded with emails from from everything going on, which is fine. Which is fine because you know where I am, there's nothing else going on here in real life. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and I guess Marianne has been the the glue that bringing a lot of people together because she's. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know Dennis for many years, and somehow he gave her my contact, um, and yeah, all this has begun. It's been. Yeah. It's been fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's it's good. I think a lot of really interesting people and okay. Mm -hmm. So where are you located now? Uh, I'm just south of Minneapolis, ah, Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm up, I'm up in Montreal. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Been there for a while, or? Yeah, I'm from here. Yeah. yeah. I'm from here, and I've uh, lived elsewhere. In fact, I was I was hoping to leave here last year, right before everything started course and um i'm hoping to do that again maybe in the fall if possible yeah 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 cool and yeah, it's funny because i think masumi is here actually yeah show. yeah okay yeah he used to be like the head of the, the comparative literature at one of the universities now i think sure. he just kind of runs like a like a, like a lab Sure. Um, called the Sense Lab, and he's been known to be spotted around some of the trendy areas, walking around with his ponytail and having having coffee. For yeah. sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're waiting for um, others. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I figured I'd. Yeah, I just like started the. Oh. All right, I'm gonna. Ha I have a quick smoke then on my balcony, so. This way, hopefully, we'll be back. All right. See ya. Hey, what's up? Yeah. Not too much, you? 
not much. I was just doing a last minute little uh, like perusing through the first that, 50 pieces. But um, Michael just uh, just stepped out for a second before we get started. But cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I, I assume Dennis and uh, he, I think he said a friend might be joining, but I don't know how many of us there will, there will be. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I think Rob is planning on coming, but I'm not sure. But yeah, Dennis oh Rob, oh like, cool. So, hmm. so how's the weather in Minneapolis? Is that where you are, Minneapolis? Yeah, it's hot. <laughs> they yeah. were just saying they were just saying we uh, we're approaching a record for most 90 degree days in a row. Jeez. Today was. I think like 95 and like 100% humidity and oh, so it's wow, a brutal day to be working outside, but all the Man. better reason to get off early to uh, do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've uh, on the on the East Coast, we've had like it, it just today cooled down, and it's a nice day today. But like all weekend was um in the 90s, which is super yeah, yeah super odd for early June. Um, right, right. I mean, like July and August, we'll get up in low hundreds, but it's weird yeah. to have it be this hot and for like a week and a half in a row. Yeah. Do you have air conditioning? <laughs> Not at work, but oh, at man. home. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Oh, hey, what's up? How much you? Oh, nice. You got a haircut. <laughs> I did. I did. I needed to eat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we were just talking about how hot it's been. Uh, for the past few days like no, not normally like this in early june yeah yeah today, today today we have some respite where i'm where i'm at it's down to like 22 same here again. yeah same here yeah today's the first day where i like i have all the windows open it feels good but i've had to have like I, I usually never use air conditioning like this early in the summer but i've had to use the air conditioning yeah. sucks yeah yeah sooner or later it's going to become uh you know absolutely necessary everywhere yeah yeah totally yeah. I mean, I think yeah. back to like my, my high school and stuff didn't have air conditioning and those kids have to wear masks, especially. Wow. I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, sure. I used to live in, I lived in Boston for like five years and never had air conditioning in the summer. Like that, this was like 10 years ago, but uh, the summers never got this hot. <laughs> it's like, it, yeah. it's happening so fast. Yeah. I remember in, definitely in elementary school, we didn't have air conditioning growing up. Just throw the windows open. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so should we wait for um, one or two more people? I guess yeah. so, all right? All right, cool. Um, did, you, did anyone read the whole text or just the first uh, half? Just the first half for me. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I read, uh, I, I wouldn't say I read the whole thing. I read the first half like pretty closely and then I just did some like skimming and I, because I, I was really curious about like where he was going with, with a lot of it. So I, I had to keep reading, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't read, I didn't read closely enough to like, uh you know give a competent presentation about it but yeah i mean uh so i guess we'll do that what like next week maybe the second half i guess we'll talk about it as a group yeah I don't know if yeah some people want to interject yeah. some other texts first yeah i guess we'll see how uh, enthusiastic we all were about this and uh, <laughs> how much we want to go on and you know see where it goes yeah 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 Sounds good. I mean, I, I, I mean I, looking at my highlights, I, I see that I, I really didn't have much to say over the whole crypto part. Right, right. Which is funny because I remember that's uh, one of the things you mentioned uh, first when that, you uh, that first comes in it. heavily at the end. The, the the last like maybe ten theses are all about these different cryptos and like how you know they're n none of them are adequate yet for what he's. I'm still like I would say overall like I I, I would. <sighs> I'm looking forward to hearing you guys have a take on some of this because I'm, I still don't know what to make of a lot of it. But yeah, the crypto comes in heavily at the end. So I guess it's worth reading through if you're interested in that. Right. And uh, when, when was this written? Do we know? I think it published in 2018. So it's pretty new. Right. Just it's pretty like, new, but a lot has happened in the crypto space since then. Uh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of um, showing its uh, true colors more and more. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Looking at some stuff here. Yeah, and and like 
Masumi, towards the end, he talks about this, how he's been involved with this kind of like, uh, I think he's at the University of Montreal, right? Yeah, where he, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's something called the Sense Lab, right? Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. He talks a little about that and there's like this like economic space agency also, which is attached to the Sense Lab. And like, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of crypto theorizing going on there. And I think that's where a lot of it comes from in the book. Mm -hmm. That's in Berlin though. Yeah. I DSA, isn't it, I think. Oh, hey, Dennis. Oh, is it? Oh, hey, Dennis. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, at least I know people in, in Berlin who are involved with that. But, um, oh, cool. Yeah. I think it's there. Okay. All right. So that's a lot of us now. Yeah. Yeah. We want to just get started. I don't know. I don't know if Rob or anyone else he had like talked about it earlier, but I hadn't heard him say anything about coming recently. So I don't know if he's coming or not. But. Me neither. I'm not sure he would be interested in this kind of text, but but uh, yeah, but I, don't, I don't know. It would have. I mean, it'd be great to have him, but it would have kind of surprised me if he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> well, I guess um, might as well get started. Yeah, get started. Um, I guess the first thing uh, maybe is to talk about the connection between this guy and. Uh, the losing guitar chapter we read uh, last time. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, we know he translated that book, and uh, yeah, and, and he and he definitely uses the concept of capture a few times in terms of the mm -hmm. idea that uh, you know this the, this processual energy that takes place in this imminent outside. So you know the common you know all the combination of all these activities happening will you know produce this 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 kind of surplus of vitality that is the object of capture which brings it into the system so he has like the field and the system and uh you know it's it, by t capturing it bringing it to the system quantifying it it you know turns life into pure profit and i think uh i think this is uh something that was running through the least this the first half that we read that uh, was uh i was i was attuned to specifically because it was um from the the last text yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a good place to start too. The, he uses the term apparatus of capture quite a lot throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can tell, I mean, he references uh, Hart and Negri as well a couple of times. And you, you can tell that kind of his, his model of capitalism is kind of based, on, I would say based on that concept. All right, I mean, I don't know that too well. Can you, can you give a very brief uh, breakdown of that? Yeah, yeah. So like, so, so, okay, so I, I would say there, there's, we can get into this a little more trying to like sketch out what really Masumi means by capitalism. So I think that's mm -hmm. important to get to, but um, he gives sort of two main, he's working with two main examples of one financial markets and two uh, data, internet data mining. And mm -hmm. so in both of those, in both of those situations, cap capital is something that captures something from the outside, something that's already going on autonomously. Capital kind of just comes from the outside and skims or rakes something off of it, right? Yeah, or, or uh, dips it in, dips into. I think is one of yes. the terms. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. So, mm -hmm. like, it's an external apparatus that kind of just like, yeah, dipping into and extracting something. Mm -hmm. um, it with and, and I would say that that model of an apparatus of capture does kind of make sense for those two uh, situations of of financial markets and mm -hmm. data mining because something's being captured. Mm -hmm. uh, but for like capitalism in general, you know, from, from like a more sort of, um, you know, Marxist or whatever uh, perspective, uh, understanding of capital and value, um, value organizes life at a more intimate level. It's not, it's not that there's like autonomous activities going on and then an external actor comes and extracts something. It's that the activities we do on a daily basis are already structured by the prerogatives of value and capital. So the apparatus of capture, I think that that image, it works for only a few kind of situations within capitalism, but maybe not for capitalism as a whole. But we can talk more about that. I don't want to go on too much. Yeah. I mean, like when I, I mean, try and think of, sorry. No. Like, I don't have that clear in my head anymore what the Lewis and Guattari said about capture, but capture was also always something that produces something, right? That's 
productive as well, not just skims off or something. And I think like like towards the end, and but we maybe begin with the beginning, even with the title. But towards the end, he goes into this idea that derivatives are kind of like the the paradigm of uh, new liberal capitalism or something like that, and that that's the one thing where the the the, the operation that capitalism um, does or unleashes. Is, is, is not just quantifying some external process. No, there's there's still quality there. There's still productiveness there. There's still like an intensity there that's somehow um, so, so so like capture is not just capture of something that's already going on. It's it's, it's more than that. Right, right. It's like um, it's like it's not like a regular resource resource extraction where you know that there's some ore or wood and you don't just that, that's not capture when you take that and bring it into capitalism because yeah. that has like a, the, the a, a materiality of scarcity, which is something that. A lot of capitalism, you know, claims is there for everything, but the way Masumi talks about it is that in the financial markets, you know, the, the myth of scarcity is exposed for what it is, because you could always just create more with less. So capture is not simply extraction or pulling something in, but like Dennis says, it's, it's, it's simultaneously productive or simultaneously guiding things within the system in order to create that extra yeah. that it can then pull from it, which, you know, you can't really do with, with ore or wood mm. or other resources that are limited yeah, yeah so it's 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 product it's it itself isn't necessarily productive but it, it it brings it brings together or at least tries to contain within its within its system um enough activity and then you know figure out ways to constantly spur it on and i think that's the inter you know the, the way we create data is simply by using the internet is a good example of that you know all this human activity say like, okay come human activity come do it all on the internet instead still do your human activity there but within certain parameters whereby we can maximize uh you know data creation from everything you do you know which yeah. is infinite it's not it's simply not a scarce thing unless of course it's scarce in terms of our own human capacity to you know sit in front of a computer endlessly which mm. it's proving that we are sadly yeah, and he, he does describe our click our clicks as labor, which I, I, I am always a little skeptical of that. Or he, he talks about like the productive consumer, meaning like, you know, by just by surfing the web or by using social media, we're being we're being productive, which I guess in a in, in a very indirect way that's true, but it, uh, I'm always a little skeptical of of over <laughs> of over uh, valuing and, and focusing too much attention on those kinds of things. Um, right, but 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 he, um, he does talk about like the, the distinction between real productive labor and uh, non-productive labor kind of disappears in with, with things yeah. like financialization and the internet. Just like um, wait, what have I written down? Just like um, um, sorry. Oh yeah, so yeah, in like the secondary. So he says in the secondary debt market that that totally obliterates the distinction between debt and credit, and you know mm -hmm. that kind of distinction obliteration then continues also to the uh, liabilities and assets become the same thing and by extension productive and non-productive labor which is in the interest of of capital to say that all all labor is productive in this way you know it becomes justification for why uh, the ceo who has the one brilliant idea while well, he takes a shit in the morning you know is worth 10 million dollar bonus that month um yeah, yeah. and uh yeah, but obviously we're not made to feel like when we're clicking on the internet, uh, we you know we're doing productive labor. We think you know we're we're just consuming we're just consuming information or entertainment or we're just leisurely clicking. But I mean, have you ever had that feeling that you start doing something online, you know, for a leisurely purpose, but then all of a sudden you do have to finish it and it kind of feels like work, um, which is how I feel about a lot of these TV series that you watch. And it's okay, I'll start <laughs> one. It's like, well, now I have to finish the goddamn fucking season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and it, and this and it feels like labor. Okay, one more. It's like clocking in for one more hour, one more episode <laughs> of this of this trek. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but as far as like um, the activities we do on the internet being productive but not productive, uh, isn't it? in some ways like it's productive for capital because they're mining the data but not really i mean it's productive for our entertainment but as far as producing like um i, I mean you're not like producing anything other than that from a capitalist point of view right i mean we are being productive in that they're then mining our activities our clicks our stuff for to sell it to advertisers and stuff, but yeah. other than that, it's other than that, it's not really productive per se, is it? Or right, it's certainly it's certainly not productive in 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 terms of um, 
you know, a, 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 lot, a broader sense of being productive in terms of human activity, creating, uh, you know, connections, Ideas. relations, all these things. Fair. But, yeah. you know, it, it, to bring it back to our, the top, the central theme of our talks, you know, it's value and it's, it's value as defined by capital's valorization, they can turn it into, you know, an advertising package or, or what worse, uh, you know, some sort of package to sell to, you know, state security apparatuses. Yeah. Um, but I've always, I've always can, wondered. Can, sorry. Yeah. No, go on. Go on. I just always wondered, I mean, like the idea, there's a weird contradiction in my head or a weird, you know, kind of, you know, destructive telos where, you know, we're given these platforms and they say, okay, you could use them for free. And then there's that whole cliche about, oh, if the product is free, then you're the product. So it's create, you know, so therefore, you know, if we, if we have all this free stuff, it's, it's less of a, it, we, we need less and less money because everything is going to be given to us for free, but they're going to sell our data to advertisers, but who are advertisers going to sell their products to if we evolve in conditions that we can have everything for free and don't need money anymore. Which I know is a lot of holes in that everywhere, but um, mm. it's, it's uh, the idea of like give people, you know, create these platforms for free where they, they don't need money because they'll just produce the money for us by using them. But eventually the advertisers they sell it to, they're gonna be like, well, we don't need your, we don't need your advertising, you know, uh, package and services anymore because nobody wants to buy anything. You've conditioned everyone to expect everything for free. Yeah. And that seems like- uh, But they go, do, that can't but go people are still buying everything from that. That's true. I, I That's see what true. you mean, but because are, the, are we really expecting things for free? I mean, as far as services, like on the internet, I think people do expect to be able to find a way to get a lot of them for free. But like the things that they're gathering that data to um, create ads to sell to us, mm -hmm. people are still buying, whether that's shit on Amazon or, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and there'll be know. some things we'll need to reproduce ourselves that, you know, can't be free, like, like food and stuff. Mm. But, you know, as, as if everything, I mean, that's, that's one of these, that's one of the criticisms of UBI is that they give us just enough that we have everything we kind of need. And then we have our, you know, we have the internet and we can play around there for free all the time. And, um, you know, nothing beyond that, that we can use to, you know, seek alternative ways of living, you know, we would just become totally passive, passive right. things. Yeah, docile bodies. Like you know, don't 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 restrict everyone's free, don't restrict anyone's freedom in, in in the material sense. Just make give you know give them this kind of idea of freedom. Make sure they don't want to do anything with it. Yeah, that but like, I I talked. <laughs> this is something I talked about with David Graeber at some point, and he, like I I was a little bit of the same opinion, right? That like uh, UBI is basically just maintenance of the system, mm -hmm. and it doesn't address inequality so much. But it's just like, okay, people are not spending enough. So we give them a little bit like the, the rich people are not going to spend they already have enough. Mm -hmm. uh, if you give the poor people a bit, it keeps the keeps the, the, the circle going or something. Mm -hmm. But it like there, there's, it does change. And like, this is not really in the text, though, but it, it does change the bargaining position, right? Like if you don't now, if your boss mistreats you, you know that, hey, you know, like, okay, the only thing I can do is quit. And then I'll have to either find another job or like do with less money. If, mm -hmm. if there's UBI, then you can say, okay, fuck you, you know, like, like you don't need, uh, so it, it changes the whole dynamic in a very radical way, which is, so, which goes a little bit against this idea that it's just maintenance. Like, right. Well, I, I guess, I guess that depends on how much the UBI is, yeah. Yeah, um, true. you know, if, if it's enough to keep you alive, but relatively miserable. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's, and that's just one of the critics, cr uh, criticisms of against, against, you know, a strong welfare state is just simply, you know, maintaining that reserve industrial army at a level that's just, you know, miserable enough that uh, the yeah. current workers have to be worried that they'll, you know, who's going to want to come up and, you know, do the work for less. Not to, not to get too far off topic, but that was one of the criticisms I would have of UBI would also be a criticism I'd have of, um, or that my father-in-law brought up about the, um, oh, what's it called? The, um, Shit. The Meidner plan in Sweden, which is mm -hmm. that he said, you know, previous to that, their unions were incredibly radical. They'd go on strikes. They'd, you know, I mean, they were, and even though it failed after that, like people just got so docile, like they wouldn't even strike much less anything more radical. Mm -hmm. And I would worry that with the UBI that people would be so grateful for their government that any kind of you know that it would just make people 
docile. Not that they wouldn't get jobs and work. I really don't care about if that mm-hmm. happened. But that as far as like uh, that they would just a lot of people I think could be more approving of oppressive governments if they had enough to live off of and lose a lot of you know, I don't know, radical organizing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I tend to think that if the um, if the political will was there to pass something like a UBI that that gave people enough freedom, like Dennis said, to like say fuck you to your boss and like have that kind of bargaining power, mm-hmm. that would require so much bottom up political will that you could. Why would you just stop there at asking for a UBI? You, you could go way further because the system mm-hmm. wouldn't. They would never do that voluntarily. They would give like like Mike said. They would give you just enough to scrape by on, but you. They, they still want a labor market. They don't want to destroy the labor market. So they want to make sure that like people are still motivated to, you know, people are still whipped into shape to, to work. Um, but they, you know, I could see it being introduced. Yeah. Just, just to plug the holes of, of basically sinking aggregate demand. But um, besides that, I don't see it happening. It's a tricky yeah. thing though. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to bring this back to the text as well. Like, like a few points, like one is like you, you, you said like clicks are called labor. That's exactly the argument that uh, Hart and Negri make for UBI, right? Saying that, hey, mm-hmm. you know, production is now biopolitical. There's no clear distinction between work and non-work. You're always producing value, even if you're not working. So that's why you need to be paid every month. And that's one like of the six, social dividend type thing. Yeah, right? that's one of several arguments in favor of UBI. Um, what, I, what I think is interesting about this text, and that's also something you could see with the economic crisis that, that now comes after COVID, right? Like in, slightly before COVID, there was already uh, short-term interest rates jumped from 2 to 10%, I think, in September 2019, and the system was going to crash again. And then the government <coughs> immediately pumped $150 billion into it and sort of saved it. And why was it crashing? Not because people aren't working enough, not because of, like, like it ha- doesn't have so much to do with the real economy. It was crashing because there wasn't enough demand for credit. And that's why, in a way, COVID was a fucking godsend for the authorities, right? Because it, it yeah, stimulated yeah, yeah. demand for credit enormously with all these stimulus packages, with all, all kinds of credit. Um, and, and one thing that I, that I think is kind of powerful in this text is also that he said that there's no nostalgia for some kind of real economy. Like often you find, okay, financial economy is a perversion of, uh, of the economy of like, uh, like being reimbursed for your labor. And that's an argument that goes back to fucking Aristotle, who says money that produced that begets money is, is unnatural. And that, that's, that's um, often there's, yeah, people criticize financial markets. And, and instead of that, they, 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 they put some notion of real economy where you work and blah, 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 blah. And it's not like the financial markets are 10 times bigger than real economy or 11 times uh, at the moment. And so yeah, it comes with huge potentials for escalations and stuff and there's huge problems there but in the text there's not this like let let me look at the passage where he says that um hmm. yeah by what standard of measurement is the extortion of labor upon which the real economy is based better than the human capital subsumption of life associated with the financialization of the economy both are regimes of power that capture and mutilate life so when like this this rhetoric of capturing a mutilation of life that I mean there's the, it also produces life somehow so this is a tricky rhetoric I think like I'm not saying it produces a nice life like I'm not I'm not <laughs> for all this but but it, it it's it's not just restrictive it's also productive I think that's important um, yeah that's what I wanted to say like there's another thing I wanted to say which is like the title is interesting right it reminded me of Nietzsche. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. It's definitely a reference to Nietzsche. Yeah, a, there's a Nietzsche reference in there, right? And in Nietzsche, the transvaluation of all values is about like, okay, we, we lost God, now we're all atheists, we're last man, we're all nihilist, we're like, we believe in nothing, and that's a problem. And uh, and here the argument is sort of okay, capitalism quantifies everything, turns everything into number, and we need to p- counterpose that with uh, something qualitative. And he has this whole example, this whole thing about the weather. The weather yeah. is something you can right. quantify, but you lose something by quantifying it. So that's that's where he looks for, this is the area where he looks for value, not the weather itself, but this sort of effective, unquantifiable kind of realm. And he somehow connects that then with with, with derivatives, but I'm not totally clear on that. But um, right. it's quite then, an interesting move to, 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 to reject all nostalgia and to, to look for values uh, so, yeah, the, on the other side somehow. Um, did anyone, did anyone get uh, this distinction he's making between intensity and affect towards the end of the uh, the first half? No. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was wondering if it's just a kind of 
just definitely just definition definition structure that's not um didn't stand out to anyone i mean he goes he he spends some time with it so it must be important i don't know if he develops it later in the book right. i mean I, I i know a little bit of like this whole like tradition of thought effect the capacity effect me effect which is all spinoza's train and intensity if i remember correctly are things that you cannot divide into like if right. you have uh, if you have two kilos of uh, gold and you divide into you have one kilo of gold the temperature you divide into it's not the same but um but but i'm, I'm not sure on this i'm not yeah uh, one thing i i don't I, th this could open a whole can of worms talking about this but like uh i was a little I, i'm gonna wait till i read the whole book closely but um i was a little skeptical about like maybe his conflation of of measurement like measuring the temperature with a uh, with a thermometer versus in that being a, a, an act of quantification of sort of a reduction of a qualitative multiplicity to you know just a, a scale of numbers that versus you know the way that in which our our labors and our activities are reduced by capital to you know numbers but the the numbers aren't quite the same it's there's there's a difference between the accounting magnitudes of capital as embodied in money and the you know scale of measurement that we that we impose on nature to reduce qualitative multiplicity so i'm, I'm a little skeptical of it seemed like his his idea of quantification he was con conflating these two things and and you know accounting magnitudes and measurements they both do reduce qualitative multiplicity but they do it in different ways and it's i think it's important not to just look at uh look at value in the same way that we look at like temperature does that yeah. make sense yeah well, and also because in in, in a realm of value it, like I, i've made this point before i think but it is productive and in the lows, like I like noticed, I haven't looked at lows again now, but uh, I read a text by a friend who, uh, that's how I know this text actually, the Masumi one. And, but he picks up on this, this the lows quotation that the sur surplus value of quote is qualitative. And wh what's that supposed to mean, right? What does that mean? Like, yeah. like, like, like quote is like, we think of it as quantitative. We think of value as something quantitative, but it's, it's not just quantification, it organizes society like like financial markets organize society and that's that's so that's not just like putting a number on something it's it's also productive um mm -hmm. but but yeah i made that point before. well i mean would you say they organize society in the sense that they you know try and make predictions in the future and then bring and then and then at the same time try and engineer the present towards that future yeah as a way to like hedge hedge their bets yeah, I guess. So. And is that and, and and then like the real world terms would this be like equivalent to you know a bunch of uh, financial you know institutions or high uh, power players getting together making the bets and then using their leverage with other entities and and big players in society to make sure that the conditions go a certain way so that their bets will pay off. I mean, and 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 does that become just conspiratorial? I don't think it's people though. Like right. in control, right? <laughs> like, right. It's it's, yeah, it's like the, yeah, it's it's not uh, yeah, it's not like five, five dudes in suits in a back room with cigars, um, but it's 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 you know kind of it's it's the intensity, for lack of a better word, or or the the imminent outside effects of a lot of different uh, players in both the bank and 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 industry and politics and yeah. you know consumer trends or or whatever. Um, but you know, there's certainly a sense that we don't. I don't. We don't. I don't, I don't think we believe that, you know, these financial, you know, gamblers, you know, make their risks and then simply just hope it pays off. And if it doesn't, oh, well, too bad. I lost my money on that one. And if it does pay off, yay. But, you know, do try and actively then, um, you know, uh, direct you know, societal forces in, in the favor of them getting their big payoff. And yeah, is too, that, yeah. yeah. They also just move money around, right? Right. That has, that has effects. And they control the yeah. taps well, of credit, credit, which is important. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they often, because they have power and influence in the government, a lot of times they'll get the government to yeah. subsidize it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. Then it pretty much guarantees a profit if you have. I mean, just recently, uh, okay, Bezos with his space program. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> that's maddening. Yeah. And that's like, uh, that's, and that's like what Fogel, um, you know his sovereignty effect in in that in his book there i mean basically he ends it he concludes with saying you know the sovereignty effect is when you can make a gamble and if you win you get the proceeds but if you lose you could shove off the losings on 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 someone else on society you know right. and then i guess in the fogel book it was you know the finance industry um 
you know, being the new sovereigns. In fact, in English, the sovereignty, in English, the sovereignty effect is titled the ascendancy of finance, which is silly because the sovereignty effect is just a better, cool name too. Well, he, he wanted to, he, he was, he, he felt bad about the title. He wanted to give it another title in, uh, but it was too late already. Oh, really so, so, he, so, he, so, he so he took advantage yeah. of the English one for it? Yeah, yeah. What's, yeah. what's the name of the writer? Joseph Fogel. Fogel. Yeah. Joseph Fogel. Fogel. Oh, I did my PhD with him. Yeah. Oh, cool. I'll look him up. Sorry, I don't know if it was an F or a PH. I'm assuming it's PH. A PH. It is a PH. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, could someone define um, an affect theory and, and why it's perceived as an externality? I, I know he wrote uh, an entire book on the subject. Um, like, so I mean, perhaps you're more acquainted with. Yeah, I guess affect theory, uh, from what I understand, and it's funny, so I'm doing some work in anthropology now that, that deals a lot with that, is basically the way we will physically manifest our reactions and responses and our approaches to what is going on. So, I mean, in, in really, really simple terms, you know, I could be sad, affect would, would then explain like, you know, tears running down my eyes or, or crying. So I think that's, that's, that's the really, really simple way in terms of those anthropologics in uh, anthropology and that's pro it's probably way more complex than that as well but i guess in this sense um you, you have the combination of all these forces that produce these intensities which are which is which is more than the sum of the parts it's it's an exp it's it's an expression of all these things happening so you know the, the weather the state of the news how i woke up how i felt this morning and so you have these intensities and then the affect would be the way we can um, see those intensities at work, at work in 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 life, in life, and and in people, and it's the affect, and it's while the intensity is, is purely qualitative, it's the affect I think that is that that can that that what they try and the system then tries to bring back and study and analyze, turn into data points and quantify and eventually valorize and profit off of. Mm -hmm. Does that sound so. Uh, so it's a, a delusion, um, a Jason concept in a way I mean like he derived it I, I, I think I understood it well and thank you for for that um, summary but um, my issue with the text and again like I agree I should finish it at all you know to properly grasp it but um, this uh, introduction of externality I I find I find it like not as helpful um, this thing, like the the and like the way in which he broke it down in, in an equation is that I mean I I like have it here like the the capitalist objective right like use value that has value in exchange which transforms into a commodity and then a commodity um with um value um what <laughs> uh, in, in production I mean I don't know like like I think like the, the terminology he employed for like profit, surplus value, money, and like even like his references to labor. I, I understand that like there's um, a desire to like update it and, and like um, con attribute all these like um, recent 20th century concepts that were added afterwards. Like I think the Luz and like were wonderful, but um, it's just, I feel like the the equation that, that Marx gave us, it still stands and just it's adding the variables like what why, why bring more external factors when I, I think I, I just, it's, I understand affect, but it's that really like the, what our focus should be. I don't know. It's not, I don't think it's transformative, but I, I could be wrong though. Um, I, yeah. What, what do you think? Sorry. <laughs> I, I totally, I, yeah, I was going to say, I, I agree. And I, I was kind of thinking the same thing the whole time, like that you, like his use of the, the term surplus value, which he's using all throughout and he's kind of twisting it into a new shape, which yeah, we shouldn't be, you know, in, inherently opposed to renovating terms. But at the same time, like when you're using terms that have big traditions of thought attached to them and you're just using them in new ways, it, it can be a little disorienting for someone who, yeah, it comes from the Marxist tradition where that, that concept has a, you know, a concrete, precise meaning. And the way Masumi is using it is not, is not the way Marx uses it, and so yeah, I, I I get a little I get a little frustrated sometimes with with that, also yeah. And it, that's not to say that metaphysics is not great and exciting. Even Marx himself, I mean, like when he refers to capital, which 
I think that's the valuable part that is not being taken in consideration because these these terms um, were used interchangeably by Masumi and and the the beauty is also that it's not it's like he made such a clear distinction on on like money and and um the use value of the transaction and the circulation like he made sure that we would have clarity and not um this ambiguous understanding of uh, how they're applied and I just I don't know I think that I know it's like ridiculous to care so much about nomenclature but I think like just to you can get crazier I mean when he I mean as I was saying like when when he goes into describing capital that's so, like so metaphysical it's almost like a re religious um I mean in a way right it is like we we have uh, a true secularization have now value, which is something that even in the introduction to, to I think capital, he he mentions that like for for thousands of years we we trying to understand and to define value, which is like not a concept that was brought about with um, capitalism per se, right? But now the way in which we have broken down it into like value form means something very different, right? Currently, mm -hmm. what do you think? Is that controversial? Hmm. Well, not controversial. Um, I've been uh, a, a lot. A lot of my thought on value has taken a turn in the last few months since my, since being introduced to Heinrich. Yeah, and, yeah, and and you know, mostly grasa grasa vu, and um, and then how quickly that's moved into the center of of, of my thinking about these things, um, and. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I definitely see continuity there in terms of I, I you know, I don't, I, I think Masumi only briefly mentions the, you know the labor theory of value in, in, mm -hmm. in one way that that it no longer holds up. Um, specifically, wait, I have a note on that. Um, yeah. Well, for, I can't find my notes now, but um, that you know that, that value is something that's you know, I think if I understand correctly, the value is something that's simply created in the capitalist process of valorization. And that, um, you know, this whole, the, it, to get down to the nomenclature, you know, the, the title of this book, The Revaluation of Value, um, basically to take to, it is an attempt at, to, to redefine, you know, the language. And in redefining mm -hmm. the language, hopefully then material processes can follow suit so that, you know, the valorization of capital no longer guides, you know, all of society's productive capacities and directions um if that uh, if that is a follows from what you were saying mariana i'm not sure yeah but wouldn't you want to break down affect then to to the to the most materialist um degree that, mm -hmm. that so that it's not so like doesn't depend on so many variables but it's like distilled to the to the point of um exactitude because i find like that um it goes back into uh like fetishism, right? Like, and like, how do you apply that? Like, it's it's again like too, too uh, unclear, and like all these like forces that I, I just found like the I know the book intended to be a little like aphoristic and like uh, we the world like kind of like uh, exciting and like condensed, but um, I felt that it lacked that uh, like maybe like a theoretical framework for to fall or like to defend it perhaps if if like me who is like not that versed in like um marxian economics could see like the inconsistencies like i don't know i'm just wondering i, I hope he doesn't see my son if you are watching this i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> DM yeah me, no i i i totally agree i I don't want to say like, oh, everyone has to refer to the, you know, constantly be in dialogue with the Marxist tradition, but not just, you know, he, Masumi's engaging with some very big issues in this, uh, in this book. And he, he also just doesn't really seem to have like many references outside of like French post-structuralism. And I think his understanding of Marx is also kind of descended from that. It's not, I don't think it's a very sophisticated understanding. He actually botches one of Marx's concepts. He's talking about absolute and relative surplus value he completely misdefined I don't want to sound like a pretentious like you know Marx nerd but like he totally 
has the wrong definition for what relative surplus value is. And that that's pretty front and central in his analysis of Marx in the book. And so, yeah, I was just a little bit underwhelmed by his uh, his lack of yeah deep engagement with with that tradition which you know is can you quickly take us back to uh where he talks about where he botches that and, and yeah let me let me and find offer a I quick, have a... and offer a quick um yes yeah errata he also uh, speaking, speaking of the manifesto language at one point there's a line saying like, occupy surplus value or occupy yeah i wrote value. i wrote that <laughs> yeah. i forget which thesis it is It's always good old control F. Yeah. Yeah. How is it uh, on page 23, thesis 16? Um, let's see which thesis. Yes, that's it. Yeah, so he says, um, okay, so I'll just read it. Um, uh, All right, he says relative surplus value, sorry, absolute surplus value is obtained by lengthening the working day without increasing wages. That's true. Relative surplus value is obtained by increasing productivity so that the socially necessary labor time that goes into the production of a commodity is lowered relative to a competitor's operations. Mm -hmm. So that, 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 that's not what Marx means by rel relative. What, what relative surplus value means is that the cost of living of the worker is lowered due to increasing productivity. So that like mm -hmm. the, co the, 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 the cost of hiring labor is uh, not, so you're extracting more surplus value throughout the day, not by extending the intensity or length of work, but by the, work, the worker's uh, wage basket becoming cheaper due to increasing productivity. Sort of like, in, like in how in the 1950s, like with the huge productivity surge in like household appliances becoming mm -hmm. And in cars, everything is produced way more cheaply. So, like, just the cost of living of sustaining a worker is cheaper. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it, but he doesn't mention that. He says that he's, he's using relative their wages. They're making more money because yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't want to be. I didn't want to be the pretentious Marx nerd to point that out. But yeah, I think it's significant though. That it's, yeah. So. I was, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I mean, yeah, I had to say it though, um, but I'm, I don't want to discredit, discredit the, the contributions, of course, and they're, I mean, they're, they're valuable things, of course, and it's, it's good that the discourse is returning, but um, I, I'm interested if you guys have read any of his uh, other books, um, any of you, do you, do you like them? Uh, no, I haven't. Like the one, the one on affect uh, in the previous. One. I because I, I know that like he, um, he like had like a um, contentious um, opinion about critical theory, and um, he, I think, like it's perceived as permissive to. Um, I, I mean, I, I would like to read that. That his contestation of Adorno, for for instance, since he's like been um, redeemed lately, despite it all, so you know, by like like Zapatista communities even are like adjacent. Mm. Sorry, sorry to derail. We can go back to the text. If you no, want. but I, I guess I guess had anyone read his book on affect uh, theory, might might have been able to help us uh, in this moment. But for now, we'll just uh, we'll guess. Yeah, um, how do you think he would define value? Like if it seems like it, the definition was um, uh, open to interpretation and, and I guess like, I don't know, what do you think of his appraisal of value form and value in the text? I mean, in, in, in like the most utopian sense, it's, 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 the, it's the intensities that arise out of, you know, all this kind of human activity that if has the potential, and it's always this potential that like can be there to help, you know, help us live more fulfilling lives or help bring people together. But it's that also that very same potential that is, you know, sucked back into the system. Um, 
so like in, in, in the most, you know, kind of vulgar sense, his value is just, uh, can be just quality of life or the potential for quality of life. That's yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It, there's a, there's a part sort of like, I, I think you mentioned Mike where he, he, he explicitly says, uh, refers to the Marxist labor theory of value and how it needs to be amended. And mm -hmm. he, he goes in after that. He, one of the things I did like about the book, I guess, uh, even if I don't agree totally with, with uh, what he's saying is, is he introduces sort of a holistic uh, conception of value where he says that like, there, you know, there's all different types of inputs to the production process. He uses the term leverage. They can be leveraged uh, mm -hmm. to, produ to produce more value than they cost, for example, but it's always a holistic process and you can never really make out what's contributing what, mm -hmm. even though, you know, capitalists try to do that. But how, yeah, how the how the production of value is inherently holistic, even if even if it's quantified after in certain ways, and that that actually overlaps with with there's a tradition of economic thought descended from uh, Srafa, who I've mentioned before, um, who who basically has a similar uh, basically has a similar model of production where you know production itself it produces a surplus if it's productive, but it's really inherently impossible to figure out exactly what's producing what in in that total quantity afterwards, even labor. So in, in a sense, it's, it's beyond Marx because it's saying labor is just one of the inputs that can produce more, that, ha that has a use value above and beyond its exchange value that you bought it for. Mm -hmm. um, so Masumi kind of is, is in that territory a little while with, with holis value holism. Right, well, I, yeah, well, I think what he's trying to say is what we, we should, what the problem is, is that, you know, you, when you look at the, you know, imminent rising effects from all these multiple parts, and by trying to then, you know, explain it, by trying to quantify, by trying to say which parts were responsible for producing this effect, which ones are internal, and then which ones are external, he says, it's not that they're doing it, it's not that we're doing it wrong, but it's, it's, it's this attempt to do it at all, which is, which is destructive, yeah. or which is, which is, you know, uh, which is the engine of capital. Yep. Um, yeah, and it's, and it's also the way, it's also reminiscent of the distinction between, you know, classical and neoclassical economics and, and political economy, economics, which is always saying, no, this is the economics, you know, poverty and inequality, those aren't economic questions, they're political questions, leave them out, whereas political economy is the recognition that one is, you know, politics and power are foundational to things like markets and econo economic activity, so it's, it's 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 this it's this constant separating of of internal external and it's this constant attempt to look at the 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 surplus whatever's created and to say okay what went into that and what didn't go into that mm -hmm. and that, that you know like i think that's that comes up comes up in the in the leveraging part a little bit and how that relates to value well it 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 it, it when we do create these things in society that are either incredibly beneficial or incredibly, you know, awesome and entertaining or profitable. Um, we, when you're constantly creating this internal external division and quantifying, it lets, you know, the capitalists say, oh, and these are the parts that were responsible for these amazing things. And therefore it's justifiable when the proceeds from those things go back to those very specific entities in this case, you know, the, the corporation or, 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 or just the genius, the genius CEO inventor or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of not only, you know, valorizing, but also kind of tagging valorizing as being the property of, of these specific factors when really those specific factors were engaging with a plethora of factors that are unquantifiable. And even the result of all of them will always be over and above all of them, uh, everything put together. And this is what this manifesto is saying we ought not do no more or we shouldn't do. Which I, I'd make a very critical point on that. I, I, that, I think that, that summed it up really well, what, what he's saying. Um, but uh, the, the critical point would be that um, it kind of goes along with what I was saying at the beginning, like the, the idea that society is already built with these like sort of self-organizing activities that people do and is you know he keeps coming back to like our internet activity which are then kind of mined but we but but the the quantitative imposition is kind of external to the activity itself what i would say is that um capitalist societies organize so intimately according to price as a kind of cognitive device it's the way that individuals but more importantly enterprises relate to one another like when an enterprise goes and buys 
its inputs and sells its outputs, the prices that it's, it uses price as a cognitive device. That's how it communicates with the world outside of itself. But and individuals do that too. Um, so the, the world is already so deeply quantified. Our built environment itself is the, the enterprise form itself. The money, it, like it goes so deep into the structure of, of capitalist society uh, that we can't, we can't just strip quant quantification off. If we did, we would need a new way to organize production and our relations with one another based on use value, which is what I'm for. But I, I don't think Masumi really goes too deeply into that. Well, yeah, if we, if we immediately stripped like quanti quantifiable exchange value from our lives, it'd be like an encounter with the real. Yeah. yeah. Half, of <laughs> Half of us wouldn't survive. <laughs> yeah, I had something. Um, I'm, gonna read, I'm just reading these quotes here. Well, does anyone want to explain these quotes? Thrown up here. Um, I think we're just going into the affect theory, but a little bit. Perhaps some of that, but. But right. Well, I guess in this case, affect theory as applied to finance would be like, like, like I said, right? Uh, the fear and the hope, the confidence and the insecurity that um financial financial activity you know uh is expressed by its actors who then act upon it right mm. i mean unlike unlike a standard you know kind of uh, industrial you know capital investment where you know you have some pretty easy parameters as to i'm going to build this how much is how much is going to cost what do i think the demand is out there how much can i get for it when you're in the financial markets, you have to like play like you know 3D chess in, in so many more levels, and and that's where a lot more and that's where a lot less cold quantification, but kind of very very you know messy human affect comes in. Uh, not only my own fear and my own hope and my own insecurities, but what I think your fears and hopes and insecurities are, and what based on what you think of that as well, and um... Um, which I I agree entirely, but um. Is, is that the material that produces capital, the labor that is exploited, the fabric? Um, I think it's just like, um, that was my issue with externality. Right, but if, but if we talk about, uh, you know- Sorry, I feel so bad that, I don't, that I'm here. <laughs> So if we come back ahead, to, you know, if we come back to exploited labor as, you know, one of the basis of capital, I mean, that's, uh, I think that's back in this uh, labor theory of value, which again, you know, from Heinrich and Masumi is something that is just an impediment towards any kind of real, you know, uh, real advancements towards a post-capital uh, society. Yeah, I mean, the who's this Heinrich guy? Oh, make me call Heinrich. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, yeah. a, he's a Marxist scholar. Um, he's German. He, uh, he's, he's just been getting popular like in the Anglophone world just in the past few years because some of his work has been translated recently. Um, also, his translator is a, is a very vocal Twitter guy, um, yeah. Alec, Alex Locascio. Yeah, he's on left Twitter. He's, he's, uh, he's sort of single-handedly responsible for, for creating Heinrich Twitter. <laughs> which is sort of like a subculture now on Twitter. Yeah, um, I, mean, I never heard of him a few months ago, and he's literally everywhere I look now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously that's obviously that's how the internet works as well. But I mean, <laughs> the podcasts, the works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what's this? What what what's what's interesting about him? What's the deal? Dan. Um, I mean, so he comes out of this this tradition of reading Marx. It's no, known. It, it comes out of Germany called the Neue Marx Lecture, like the mm -hmm. new, new reading of Marx. And uh, it kind of descends from the Frankfurt School. One of the main figure, the, sort of the figurehead of the movement, is this guy named Hans Georg Backhaus, and he was Adorn He was one of Adorno's PhD students. Another guy named Helmut uh, Reichelt. Um, it's basically like rereading it. One of, the, one of the core features of it is, is uh, sort of moot, like anti-Ricardianism, seeing Marx as having basically a monetary theory of value. And when Marx uses the word value, he's still kind of straddling 
he, he picked up the Ricardian th labor theory of value because that was by far the, you know, that was the economic theory at the time. It was basically unquestioned. Um, and Marx picks it up, but he goes beyond it in a lot of ways. He, he, he foregrounds money as sort of like what I was just saying before as a, not just like a, a, a thing that's imposed on labor, but as a thing that intimately organizes social life and that the way that co commodified social life is organized as, between these separated firms and these separated individuals where people sell things to each other would be impossible without money. Money's a cognitive device. It's not just like an external imposition. It's what organizes everything. And for, so Heinrich is, he's not concerned as so much with, uh, with, with these traditional questions of, of, you know, values created in production, surplus values created in the factory, and then it's siphoned off externally. Heinrich looks at sort of the totality and how the circulation process, you know, how, how our labor and our activities are validated only in the exchange process. So we can't really locate the creation of value in production or anywhere in particular. Does that sound right, Mike? Yeah, it, it, yeah. The idea that value is is, is is located in the exchange process and not in the productive process is uh, one, one of the big one of the big jumps yeah, yeah. that you got to make when you go to him. And 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 just at a formal level, he's incredibly insistent that you can't read Volume One without Two and Three. And he says what he lays out in mm. Volume One, which most people uh, are most familiar with, is only there to help the theoretical arguments that will come in Two and Three. And yeah. and for Heinrich, there's been a lot of you know, kind of erroneous Marxist scholarship because of this uh, emphasis mm -hmm. on volume one. Yeah. Um, so labor theory of value out the window, crisis theory, uh, law of tendency of the, of the yes, public yeah. fall. He's not, he's, uh, he's again, and, and I think that's what a lot of people, there, there's already, I've already, there's already an anti Heinrich movement and uh, yeah. a, lot, a lot of them based on uh, as criticisms of, of Heinrich's wanting to do away with the crisis theory and the labor, ten, labor uh, tendency of the profit to fall, which I think um, I probably for most of us, the idea that the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is seeming more and more counterintuitive in, in today's society, which is, which, was, uh, which is what makes Heinrich, which, what makes Heinrich refreshing, as is the labor theory of value. I mean, there's, there's great moral reasons to like the moral labor theory of value, but it's, it does feel in, intuitively um, weak these days. And um, I mean, even the idea that 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 price that that the cost of labor will always kind of fluctuate around the cost of the thing the, the, of, of the subsistence level of living. Like I know we have minimum wage to extent, which is kind of the, the modern manifestation of of what it called the subsistence level setting the cost of labor. But I mean, for so much to circulate around these ideas, um, always felt a little like a, like like a like a like a leap of faith, mm. and. Um, as, and I still need to you know, dig deeper into Heinrich, but it seems like he's someone that, that recognized the, the weakness of those ideas as well. And not just for his own sake, he, he believes that like, no, Marx did too, that there was a lot of misreadings of Marx based on things like, you know, only reading volume one or looking at the way Marx talks about labor theory of value, which Marx does because it was the dominant one of his time and to make that assumption that, and therefore Marx believed it too for Heinrich. Marx talks about it simply because it was dominant in his time to use it as an exemplary uh, argument. But then when you get the totality one, two, and three, you see that it wasn't where he wanted to stop. Yeah. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to do more Heinrich. Um, maybe put him on the list for down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, in fact, got every, every, and in fact, like uh, the end note stuff and the Jasper Byrne stuff, I mean, I see mm -hmm. that's, that's all, that comes right out of that. That's in the same reading, the same yeah. coming out of that no Noia Marx lecture. Yeah. It's, okay. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a Noia Marxist, I guess now. Yeah. It's <laughs> like that. He also, um, you know, he, there's also, he also mentions that like Marx in Marx himself, there's this movement away from the uh, uh, labor theory value in the machine fragment, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 really yeah. Yeah, Masumi fantastic. mentions that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, 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 that in that text, it's kind of like, it's, it's capital itself that, Due to its trajectory of mechanizing and autom automating, is doing away with labor, and he says that's it's the that, moving. Is like, that text is like proto Deleuze or something. The way I remember it, it's such a crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of like it is. weird modernist text, right? I, I was um, I was listening to this guy Frederick Frederick Pitts who yeah, wrote a yeah. book recently on value, but he I have was that, book. that Yeah, so he was saying that fragment of the machines is basically science fiction, mm. yeah. which is also one of the reasons it's so popular and gets and gets talked about a lot. 
um, but potentially its popularity is kind of overemphasizing its importance in the oeuvre, but I haven't read it in a while. I, 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 this Heinrich, that's what Heinrich Pitzka, says too. Yeah, well, Pitts, Pitts uh, definitely is, comes out of Heinrich because um, I was listening to him speak and he just, yeah, um, says that that's one of the ur texts for this new direction. And so, yeah, this value book, have you read it? Is it, is it anything interesting in there? Yeah, it's interesting. He, yeah, so he's he comes out of the Heinrich tradition and he, mm -hmm. uh, he's actually I've uh, maybe it's not in the value book I read another book of his I think it was his first book um where he kind of juxtaposes the Italian autonomia tradition of reading Marx like Negri basically but some others too like uh, Mario Tronti and uh mm -hmm. other I'm blanking on the other other names but um Lazzarato, Lazzarato yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he juxtaposes that tradition with the Heinrichian tradition and he's he's very critical of that Italian tradition which leans heavily on that fragment of the of the machines on the machines uh text but yeah that that's an interesting book um yeah i yeah yeah so but by freeing value from both you know labor theories and you know just capitalist theories of, of surplus value as unpaid labor you know so you know i think masumi yeah. Assume he starts on this on this footing, or I mean, th this is his, this is the call to arms of the book to you know to liberate value from these old, dead uh, concepts, and you know from what I'm from what I'm getting, he sees the he sees the logic of finance, which can be turned on its head. He sees the logic of derivatives, which can be turned on their head, um, in order to you know be possible models for a post-capitalist future. Which in the first half of this book, I don't, you know, it's that's still really, really unexplained to me. But um, yeah, he says that finance, capital, and the derivative is like is more the more true face of capital based on, you know, because it does away with this the myth of scarcity. It's able to just produce more with less, and somehow, you know, a post-capitalist future needs to look at that model and potentially mimic it, but not for the purpose of of Pro profit production for you know private hands but for uh the the production of a society whereby we can always engage you know do things for the sake of experience i mean so so masumi says that value real value is uh, is, an, is an experience for itself and it's wait let me i want to find this uh quote here yeah. What is a quality of life construed as value? The answer is simple. A qualitative life, a qualitative life value is something that is lived for its own sake, something that is a value in and of itself in the unexchangeable currency of experience. Right? So, you know, we're all we're, and we we're, we got our experience everywhere. We're you know out on the street at the parties when we're online. And uh, but basically capitalism tries to take these experiences and say, well, you're not you're not worth while well, in yourselves, you're not worthwhile in on your own. You're only worthwhile if we can suck in something from it and produce something from it and then resell it. And uh, I mean, I think in a lot of this uh, talk, one of the, one of the best examples, one of the most examples I always hear come, people come back to was like punk rock in the seventies, you know, which was not like a certain kind of fashion that would later be mass produced and sold in malls. It wasn't even the albums that would be hard pressed and sold in the record stores, but it's like you were there, you know, and you were there, you were in the experience of it all. And, you know, we look to the past, we romanticize these certain era, eras in the past, either punk rock in the 70s, or I don't know, the expats in Paris in the 20s, or, you know, the French symbolists. And, uh, you know, and you, look at the, you look at the present, and it seems like, oh, those things don't exist anymore. Or, we had or, techno, or, man. We had techno in Berlin. We had it. We had it. We had it. <laughs> but it's gone now. Is Verkhein still closed? <laughs> yeah, that's it. But uh, I know we have nothing, but we, but it seems like we have less and less. Or like when I look at my young nieces and nephews, I'm like, man, the culture you're going to grow up to is going to be terrible. You guys going to have nothing left. And um, you know, again, uh, if if those experiences are the, is are the raw materials that are you know fostered on and then sucked back in by capital, and we have less and less of those, you know, will capitalism eat itself? Is the question. I also, I also think it's difficult to, to look into experience f f as a source of a, a politically useful notion of value or something. I, 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 maybe that's in the second half of the book, but it's hard to think how that would work even. 
Yeah. But you hear you hear it in you hear it in commonplace speech all the time. It's like, oh, I'm sick of buying things. I don't want to like just go to the store and buy stuff. I want to spend my money on experiences. I want you know travel being the big one. Mm. Um, experience, but experience has become a commodity. That's true. Yeah. Right. Um, I look at my I look at like my father who plans who plans a, a holiday somewhere, say. And for like for weeks leading up to the holiday, he's looking at every every other tourist's pictures that they put there, and he's studying those pictures. And he's visit, you know. And then when he gets there, he takes the pictures. And for months after, he's showing everyone those pictures. You know, the experience is just like this vanishing point in between all this anticipation and memory that you are going to uh, ex- uh, experience again, always mediated through you know through 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 digital digital apps, which will then create therefore create data points. Mm-hmm. So yeah, where is Masumi's experience that is out, that, that that is still outside of this uh, outside of this framework of of of, of capture and accumulation, uh, where you know a new kind of value can. It's, just, it's also like I mean, this is maybe it's super lame to do that, but it, but you could totally do this Derridian critique or something of this, right? There is no outside of this this realm of. Um, Capture there, the, like like it, it produces as well. It it's, it 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 shapes us. It subjectivates us, etc. There is there is no outside to that maybe, but but maybe yeah. Il n'y a pas de text, but I don't know if that's a very lame kind of argument to me. I guess that's not too like maybe in the same realm of what I was saying before, just about how how much would truly have to change in everyday social reproduction to get rid of value as we know it and really re- revalue things basically like and that's why i'm curious how how masumi is going to tie derivatives into yeah that's also my big question that's why i'm going to yeah. the second half of the book either if we talk about it or not yeah yeah um der- the derivative section is one of the few sections i didn't go over before, uh, for a second time before um today but uh, i think I'll, I'll definitely go over it before i read that second half because it seems a little sci-fi as well yeah it's an interesting move to make though right like theoretically to 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 sort of like look at it like the 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 core of the enemy and look there for like revaluing the notion of value it's kind of it's yeah it's 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 a it's a it's a big wager i wonder if it'll be i wonder what he'll say and then, like, I think he hangs it onto this, like, here, hold on, I have it here, um, where he says that it's an exception. Yeah. The effective resonance resists measure. Relation is always more lively than its system. I uh, know, oh, sorry. Lemma. The conversion of the quanti- qualitative into the quantitative is the translation of the singular into the general. The financial markets represent a highly significant exception to this rule. Mm-hmm. So, 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 there's so there's something weird about them about this 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 this, this, this how capture operates there, and I, and I would I would imagine it has something to do with their productive nature and and how it's somehow qualitative and quantitative at the same time. But I don't know. Well, I mean, like, the, like un, unlike a, unlike a basic like security like a stock or bond, where all we're looking at is you know all we want is it for it to go up or conversely down if we're on the other end of that. With derivatives, mostly you just want it to move, and you know you could take yeah. a, you could take a bet on the direction of its movement, but you know you're not really looking for a comp for the underlying asset to like you know grow or improve or anything like that. It's just it's the volatility, and its action and its movement that you know creates all these opportunities for for risky and risky and non investments and and their and their subsequent hedgings, right? Yeah. He says more about it here. The derivatives are a special case where quantification itself tends toward becoming imminent to the capitalist field in an asymptotic movement that can never complete itself. With derivatives, the capitalist system tends toward the limit where the gap between system and process tendentially closes. So that's where you have it, right? Like the, the economic yeah. system is no longer closed and it sort of like engulfs everything and the, and the border becomes unstable. This occurs as a consequence of the maximization of surplus value of flow. Capitalist capture and mutant flow converge. I kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Um, quantification rejoins the singular, becoming fully event- evental rather than re- reductively indicative. This is not an overcoming of capitalist capture, but a singular intensification of it. Yeah. I have the only way I was able to make sense of that, because I, I also like marked that passage, is like ma- I, I w- I've been reading a little bit in like the planning literature, like sort of uh, you know uh, the 
there's this famous book called Towards Botan- a New Socialism. Not Botanskin Chapello, they do a lot of Oh, no, no. No, but just more more about like computerized planning, like if market, you know, getting rid of markets and planning things like not in the, well, actually the, the book I read recently was like, what if the Soviet Union hadn't have collapsed? Could we use the computers we have now to make that sort of top-down planning system work? I'm not sympathetic to that personally, but what I was thinking is like, maybe Masumi's derivatives would be something like a planning algorithm where like it would mm. knit it would knit a lot of different things together in an input output matrix and sort of have a more, like predictive, like, so if, if we're, if we have a shortage of something, then the derivative would like make adjustments throughout the matrix, throughout the input output matrix and like adjust stuff. That's kind of how I was thinking about it. Like, well, and then it, it sounds like, and then it sounds like a blockchain would be like the infrastructure to run, run that kind of like derivative based algorithmic logic. Of... Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well yeah, I would, guess I, it would, you know, it'd be, it'd be decentralized and, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. But what, yeah, what I'm, what I'm interested in is, is like in Masumi's kind of, what's his image of a negation of capitalism? I know he's going to, he gets to it in the end. I I skimmed a little bit, like I said, but I'm going to read it more closely, but I just wonder like, like basically is he a communist or is he like sort of like, is he, is he, is his, is his utopia sort of like small scale productive units that's like sort of Proudhonian socialism of exchange, still exchanging and there's still labor markets and there's, but basically like, uh, or, or like, yeah, like sometimes the best way to understand someone's theory of capitalism is also by understanding their theory of like communism or what comes after capitalism. Hmm. And I, so it, yeah, I'm, I'm going to read more and try to try to map that out. Yeah. It beats me as to the answer to that. Anyone, have yeah. a, anyone have an idea? Is it, is it, is it a hippie utopianism? Is it a- <laughs> Is it, fully, is it a fully a luxury, fully automated luxury communism? Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> these are the questions I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the the F the whole affect line of thinking does have something hippie-ish over it, I guess. Affect expresses intensity without annulling it. So I just I just landed on that on page forty-five. Um, mm-hmm. Right, uh, but there was the. There- And, uh, but they do not express themselves. And that sentence is a little metaphysical to me. I'm not really sure about it, but, um, but, but because they cannot express themselves or their form of expression is just one of the sets, but because they can't express themselves, they can be annulled. And this seems to be a, an interesting point worth- um, Sorry, what? Uh, I didn't understand. So, so because the intensity can't express itself, it can be annulled, it can be canceled out. I see. Right. And um, so basically, and they're not, and like I said before, they're annulled by trying to quantify the elements from which this intensity emerged. And um, right. And, and, and that's how, and that's how the system gets its fuel. So it takes these intensities, it quantifies them, it annuls the intensities, original uh, potential possibility, the, it's, it's eventual, it's processual, processual possibility, all those fancy words. And, uh, and the system fuels itself by the annulling of these intensities. So we bring that into now with the sentence, affect expresses intensity without annulling it. So an intensity that can't express itself, but the system, annul- and because of that, the system un- annuls it. But affect is now, I guess, posited as a counterforce to the system because affect is what expresses the intensity without annulling it. So for example, um, you know, I'm there in 1977 in Lower East Side in New York City and uh, you know, I'm feeling all the intensity of this, of this burgeoning punk movement. And you know, the affect is just how I feel and the, and the energy it gives me and you know, the way it makes me more sociable, go out to meet people and these are all great things. Um, and I'm not annulling the intensity by just being given the opportunity to live this come and, you know, they take the, they look at this punk scene as a source of 